So today I'm going to talk about um, digestive health and uh, a lot of what other people have already said um, will really uh, apply to what I have to say as well because it, our body is all one unit and a connection. Um, we can't separate emotional health from our physical health and uh, you'll know that if you've ever had to um, be off running somewhere, running to uh, a social occasion or something like that and uh, uh, when I had really bad IBS, it would always flare up when I had some place to go. And Ron and the kids would be sitting out in the car, and I'd be in the bathroom, and they'd be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and, and waiting for me. And there's a reason for that, because there's a, the gut-mind connection and the connection between stress and, and our body is really strong. And so I would be so concerned about not getting sick so that I could get there in time that I would basically make myself sick. So, anyway... So, did you know that in your body right now there are a trillion microorganisms, they're crawling on your skin, they're inside your gut, they're around your lungs, they're around your heart, they're through your blood. And does that creep you out a little bit? But it shouldn't, because these microorganisms are extremely important to our health. And... In our society today, we have really come to think that we need to kill all bacteria. Uh, we have antibacterial this, antibacterial that, kill the bacteria, kill the bacteria. Um, but what we're really finding, and I know Carla's really up on this science, um, that these little bacteria, these little viruses, these little fungal, some of them, yep, some of them we call bad because they're really not all that great, but they still, those ones even still have a function in our body. We still need them. I had a severe overgrowth of candida, which is a fungal overgrowth. That was um, one of the root causes of my health issues, and I needed to deal with it. But those are still needed. We don't need to eradicate all of those from our body. They still have a function and a form and a purpose inside our body. We need the, like Carla said, we need to have more of the good guys and less of the bad guys. So how do we do that? How do we come to terms with that they aren't all bad, um, come to a relationship where we respect what they have to do in our body, and we come a symbiotic relationship, I believe. Sometimes we heard about in science back in junior high and that kind of thing. Um, but these are really important. A lot of these um, organisms help us with our digestion. Uh, they help us produce and digest proteins and lipids, carbohydrates. They create uh, an nutrients and produce things like vitamins and anti-inflammatories that our body just can't do by itself. It needs these creatures within us um, to do those things for us. Even though there are a trillion of them in our body, which outnumbers our human cells about 10 to 1, it actually, because they're so tiny, it actually only adds up to 1 to 3 percent of our body weight. So a 200 pound person has about 2 to 6 pounds of non-human um, organisms inside our body. Um, but that, like I said, that's not something to fear. It's not something to be concerned about. But we need to, we need to just realize what their role is um, so that we can come uh, to a relationship where we can uh, use them to our advantage and help us to get a better health. There was a project a few years ago called the Human Binome Project. And they calculated that there was over 10,000 different microbial species that occupy the human ecosystem. And years ago, they, they didn't identify them, but now they've actually thought that they have probably identified up to 80 to 90 percent of those organisms. And some of those are deep inside our cells themselves and make up an important and um, completely necessary part of our system. Even things like there's studies that show that there's even certain types of um, parasitical things that aren't necessarily bad uh, in our body, too. There are some studies that show that a certain type of parasite actually helps our heart or, and helps different organs. And so they're doing a lot of research nowadays on that kind of thing so that we can have a better understanding of what they are and what their function in our body is so that we can know how to protect them. Another term we hear a lot about nowadays is something called mitochondria which is a deep inside, there's a tiny, tiny little part within our cell that actually helps to create the energy um, that our body requires. And so if we d damage those delicate little mitochondria, um, then our body can't actually produce the energy that we need. 
So I'll rewind a little bit to tell you, you know, how come I've got such a great respect for these little creatures that live inside of me. For years, I suffered with terrible IBS. I let it control my life. I was late constantly. Like I said, I don't know how many times Ron would either be in the car with the kids or outside with the dog waiting to go for a walk. Um, and then sometimes he'd go for a walk, come back 45 minutes later, and I'd still be in the bathroom. And I let it control um, what, what I could do and what I couldn't do and where I could go and, um, and how often... Uh, where I went because I knew I used to use it as an excuse that Tyson wanted to know where all the bathrooms were which was great when he was little because he did <laughs> um, but later on it became a real necessity that I knew where all the bathrooms were so thanks for Tyson and his little um, uh, attention deficit issues and type of his, um, that he always wanted to know where those washrooms were because um, later on I was very grateful for that so our struggles aren't always necessarily a bad thing right I mean, we learn to turn our struggles into our triumphs For years, uh, when Tyson was diagnosed with uh, autism, I asked the doctor about a gluten diet, a gluten-free diet, and they told me that that was crazy. Yes, it worked, and yes, many people got great success out of it, and it helped, um, but it put so much stress on your family. Why would you want to put your family through all that? And mom had already been gluten-free at that time for probably close to 20 years, and yet I still bought into their... BS and uh, believed them and I didn't pursue that anymore and I'm still grateful for that though because if it wasn't for that I wouldn't be at I wouldn't have come to the conclusion that I have now and have the commitment um, to finding the answers that I do because we wouldn't have had the struggles and we wouldn't have seen the struggles within some of our family members which I'll get to in a minute um, that created the, the drive and the passion that I have now to make sure that people understand the connection between the foods they eat and um, the inflammation that is in their body and the symptoms that their body is um, screaming out sometimes loudly to tell them about. But when Andrea was in uh, grade six, the gluten issue came up again. I had been asking the doctors for years and years, and I kept insisting on... Um, celiac test because I understood that mom was celiac because in, I was in grade six she had to go on a gluten-free diet and it wasn't until a few years ago that I actually realized that mom wasn't celiac either she was still considered gluten sensitive and um, so that that helped a better understanding of what was going on because whenever my test would come back negative 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 it's not celiac disease not celiac disease it just didn't make any sense to me I seem to have a textbook scenario of, um, of gluten issues. Mom had gluten issues and then now all of a sudden in grade six Andrea loses 75 or so percent of her school year because she's constantly sick with digestive issues and the same kind of issues that I was having. And that really quite honestly kind of pissed me off because I've been trying to get this answers all these years and yet um, they kept telling me that's not what it was. But here's my daughter, here's my mom, all three of us have the same issues. How in the heck can it not be a genetic issue, right? I mean, what's the chances of three people, three generations in the same family having the same issues and it's not connected in some way? So how is it connected though, right? Back then, it wasn't really all that common to talk about gluten sensitivity. You either had celiac disease or you didn't have celiac disease. And if you didn't have celiac disease, eat the gluten. Gluten is good for you. You should eat it. Um, but now we know that gluten sensitivity, um, that celiac disease really, in my opinion, celiac disease is just like autism. You know, if you know anything anybody knows about autism, there's a scale. There's a whole bunch of syndromes that can actually come up on the autism scale, right? We've got attention deficit, we've got autism, we've got uh, Asperger's, we got all these different things. Like, there's a lot, right? I know there's some of you that work with kids in the school. And in my opinion, gluten should be considered that same kind of thing, that there is a scale in which... Um, and I think that in, in time, we will get to that point. Because uh, our definition of celiac disease means that there has to be damage to the uh, villi, or the villi, that are in our digestive system. Why in the heck would we want to wait till we permanently damage the villi in our gut before we actually do something about this? It's too late then. 
right? Why would we want that? Why would we want that for our family members? Why do we want that for ourselves? So our society has to change. And it changes because people are willing to stand up and tell our story. And um, through all of this, with all of our, because I'll get to my aunt in a minute as well, but people need to understand that there is a connection. They need to understand that sometimes the answer really isn't that difficult but you have to have your heart open to looking at other options, um, that there might be something more, a bigger picture in play here than you really realize. Which brings me to, to my aunt. Some of you may have known my aunt. <sighs> Sorry. Six years or so ago, I can't remember what year she had her surgery. Um, she had such severe issues with um, evacuating that she would uh, go to drastic measures of donning a plastic glove. Sorry to get kind of graphic. Um, and did all kinds of things. And she felt in her heart she was struggling so much that she had decided in her brain that the only way to solve this problem was to get the doctor to do an ileostomy. Which, if you don't know what that means, that means that they're going to put a slit in the bowel somewhere doesn't always in the same spot. I guess well, technically the right word for that is. But um, in her case, it was right at the junction between the small and the large intestine. And so the rest of her life, she would have to um, clean out a bag to go to the bathroom. And she thought that that would have to be better than what she was going through. At least it was more predictable. Um, and it had to be better than the, the bowel cramps, the bloating, the, um, all the issues that she was going through. And I sat in that clinic with her that day, and the doctor said, well, that's pretty drastic. Why would, you want to, why would you want to do that? Most people, when they come to me and I tell them this is what they have to do because they don't have any other choice, um, they, they fight me <laughs> on it, and they want to look at all the possible options to do something different. And Flo had already decided in her, her mind that that was the only way she could, um, to could live any kind of a normal life. And so she explained her situation and what she had to do, and he agreed that that was no way to live, and eventually he decided that, you know, she seems to have really done her homework on this, and that's really what she wanted, then I guess he would do it. And, but the thing is, is, we never looked at what the root cause of all this problem was in the first place. So she has the surgery, she got really sick, um, and she started to recover a bit from that. But the problem in the gut is still the problem in the gut. It doesn't really matter. She, all she did was bypass the large intestine, right? And so the problem that was happening um, was still it was there. It was causing the, the appliance to blow off on her. Um, so she was miserable all the time because, I mean, can you imagine being in public and then your appliance comes off? So she had, had clothes with her. She wore multiple layers of clothing all the time because she didn't, never knew when it would blow on her. Um, you know, she had to have... Sometimes strangers come and help her with stuff because um, she couldn't physically, you know, see what she was doing. She would try to, try to do it with a mirror or whatever. And it made life really miserable for her. But Because like I said, we still didn't deal with that root cause of what was happening in the first place. And I see so much of this happening with so many people. I know many people who have went to drastic measures to take out sections of their intestinal part, large or small, but they still haven't looked at what caused the problem in the first place. And so, yes, they might improve some of their symptoms, but they still, they still have some of those issues, right? And so searching for that root cause to really find out what is the problem in the first place, it's just like stress, right? You know, if we don't deal with what's causing it, it's not going to go away. It's still going to be there. Um, so we need to really look at what we can do to figure out why this is all happening. Um, eventually, Auntie Flo was diagnosed with um, endocrine cancer and passed away two years ago. But they really believe that the root cause, that or the, the initial location of that, because endocrine cancer moved, so wherever it started is not where it was at. It settled on her liver, and it settled on her spine, and it settled on a spot on her sternum. Um, but it started someplace else. 
and they never really for sure found exactly where it started, but they suggested um, that it was most likely started in the digestive tract somewhere. So it's really important that we start looking. If, we, if you know anybody that has digestive issues, if you know somebody who has autoimmune condition, we need to look and we need to find what those root causes are um, before it's too late and we've done the permanent damage um, and then we can only improve our situation so much, right? We can only expect m certain miracles to happen if we've already damaged the physical structure. Um, so it takes, as that takes more time to repair and sometimes it, it's a, a part of our body that's really not that easy to rebuild it. totally lost where I was at in my notes. <laughs> but I realized it was time that I put my big girl panties on and um, pull them up and stand tall and, this and get out there and talk about this issue because nobody wants to talk about digestive issues. Nobody wants to talk about their bowel habits. Um, it's kind of taboo. And that's maybe why it has become such an academic within our society because we're not talking about it. Just... A few weeks ago, just before Christmas, our, our community, in our greater area of community, um, lost a really wonderful woman who only a month or so, a month and a half, two months ago, less than two months ago, found out that she had um, bowel cancer. And she had uh, surgery and they removed part of it. And, and unfortunately, she passed away right before Christmas. The thing is, she didn't have any symptoms, really. So you can't wait till the symptoms show up to start doing something about it. We have to look at our habits and, and start making changes now before, um, before we have to be a statistic. So, brighten things up. So, Dr. Mark Hyman, who is a wonderful um, leading functional medicine doctor uh, in the world, talks about there's three causes, three causes to autoimmune conditions, which are food reactions, infections and toxins and then of course diet and stress because diet and stress play a part of every illness that we have in our society it doesn't matter and then unfortunately medical community often says diet hasn't got anything to do with it well really come on does that make any sense could we just eat pizza and beer all the time only and you don't think we're going to have a problem it's like that doesn't even sound logical Right? We know Hippocrates knew. You know, he said, food is thy medicine. How many years ago that car? Was it like 1300s when he was at something like that? Like, that's a long damn time ago. How come we're so slow at figuring this out? Right? So I know the other thing you're probably thinking is, well, but autoimmune conditions have a genetic component to them. That's true. Autoimmune conditions can have a genetic component. However, the genes load the gun and the diet and lifestyle pulls the trigger. It is our choices in life that help to decide whether that gene gets turned on or not. So we have a lot more control than we realize. Our genes do not defy us. They're just a part of us. They don't defy whether or not um, those genes get turned on. So let's talk a little bit about diet. I often hear people say, well, I need a really healthy diet. Um, well, the definition of healthy is always interesting <laughs> when you follow and see what they actually are eating. But it's not that these foods are bad foods. I think Carla talked a little bit about that. It's not that, and well, so did Robin. Robin had said too, right? Foods are not necessarily good or bad. It's how we use them, and it's how our body processes them. So I can't eat potatoes. Is potatoes a bad food? You guys eat potatoes? They're pretty tasty, right? There's a lot of good nutrition and value in potatoes. We're a meat and potatoes kind of world in Western Canada, especially. In Can uh, well, I guess in Eastern Canada too, since potatoes come from Prince of Edward Island. But potatoes aren't necessarily bad. But my body doesn't like them. And when I eat them, it causes inflammation. It causes me to have bloating and um, dysfunction in my gut. Uh, causes the duodenum area um, to blow up like a balloon and I look like I'm nine months pregnant. And it also causes the arthritis in my hands to swell up and be very painful and uncomfortable. So why would I eat it? 
It's a simple solution to my hands, not hurting all the time so I can enjoy life and go do things, is to not eat potatoes. Then I'd rather just not eat potatoes. You know, the medical community would want to give me some kind of medicine to uh, stop the reaction and... Why don't I just stop the reaction myself by not eating potatoes? I've heard Carla say many times when people come to work with her, they all say, I'll do anything you want, Carla, as long as you don't mess with my food. <laughs> but the answer is, and then I've heard say, well, that's too bad because I'm going to mess with your food. <laughs> <laughs> because food is the first place to really start. Gluten and dairy and soy and corn, eggs, peanuts, processed foods, processed sugar, and artificial sugars are the biggest culprits. There are some others, like I said, nightshades like potatoes and tomatoes and peppers. They're all what we call nightshades. And eggplant. I don't like eggplant. So. Not that's something we eat here in Canada very often, right? Although, when we were traveling, uh, eggplant certainly was on the, the list a little more often. But those are the most common. And I know I hear so many times people say, Oh, you gluten-free people. You just want us all to be gluten-free. Well, there are some people that just like to push their values on everybody else, and I understand that. Um, but if you actually understand what gluten is doing within your body, You'll understand why there's some of us that are very passionate about making sure that you understand what gluten really is doing. And there's a lot of different aspects to gluten. Gluten's a very complicated subject because gluten has a lot of things going on, a lot of reasons why gluten is a more common um, allergy issue uh, or a food intolerance issue than it used to be. And we don't have time to really go into all of them, but Farming practices play a part of that. They're, we spray them now more. We've genetically modified the grain to have more gluten in it. Excuse me. A lot of these things all play into the factor. But one thing that doesn't change that they found out quite a few years ago now is something called zonulin. So zonulin is something that is contained within gluten that actually creates leaky gut in every single person that eats it. That doesn't mean that everybody has to stop eating gluten because not everybody has a bad reaction to it. Some people's body can actually deal with that. But what zonulin does, we heard about e leaky gut earlier, so you guys kind of, anybody really know what leaky gut is? A little bit? So leaky gut just is, is when there is a single cell membrane, or there is a single cell membrane, that's between our blood system and our digestive system. And normally it's this nice tight junction. Those cells are really nice and tight, and you can, right? And they don't open. Things like stress, things like uh, other foods that we eat, um, and things like zonulin open that junction and allow the opening um, to open it up enough that undigested proteins and foods on our system, toxins, and other things get into our blood system. And when they get into our blood system, they create inflammation. Chronic inflammation is what causes chronic illness. So if we stop the inflammation and stop the onset of that inflammation constantly, then we can let our bodies do what they need to do. Yeah, Carrie talked about that, right? She let her body heal itself, uh, right? So if you give the body what it needs, the right environment, the right foods, water, exercise, all these things that we know we're supposed to have. It's not rocket science. We've been told this for years. We just don't do it. But when we give the body what it needs um, and give it half a chance, it will heal and take care of what needs to happen. So in this portion of the population that eats gluten and doesn't have a problem, the, the zonion will open it up, some undigested foods or toxins or whatever gets into the blood system. But the blood system and the immune system takes, goes and says, hey, you don't belong here. You're out of here. Get out of the pool. You're, you're kicked out. And it takes care of it in its own way because their immune system is working properly. But if your immune system is not working properly and that zonulin opens up that junction and allows those things to get into your body, then you start having the symptoms. Like I said, the, the uh, inflammation. Um, you might have arthritis. You might have... IBS, you might have Crohn's, you might have dementia, d depression. Almost every illness that plagues your society is actually an autoimmune condition, other than heart disease and cancer. 
And now they say heart disease and cancer have an autoimmune reaction to them. There still is a connection to it. So we need to look at at the gluten. That's why one of the things that we look at first is gluten because of the zonulin that, or one of the reasons, because the zonulin is going to open up those junctions. And the other reactions are often, the other food reactions or the other um, allergy reactions, dust, hay fever, you know, those other things, are because the immune system is so overtaxed um, that it has no other choice than to react because you put so much pressure on it. You can only expect it to do so much. So if we look at removing what's causing it in the first place, we start to look at what the gluten is doing. Often if you remove gluten and dairy, it goes together a lot. Um, so we always need to look at those two things at some point in, t in time together. But if we start by just removing the gluten, often the other things will fall off and they won't be as big of a problem. Because again, we're stopping this opening. But just looking at gluten isn't going to solve the problem because like we heard earlier about stress, stress opens up this junction as well, right? And so when I lost all the weight and I um, changed our health, our diet, our, our lifestyle changed a lot, people would say, well, what did you do? And I'd you know, tell them I cleaned up my diet, I removed the gluten, I, but I, right? I got rid of the toxins and I started using essential oils instead of, um, up, instead of my medications and all those kind of things. And they said, oh, so you did a whole bunch of things you really don't know what you did you missed the point. The reason it worked is because I looked at the whole picture. I didn't just focus in on one little thing. I looked at the whole picture because my body as a whole, what I do to one ha part of my body that affects the other part of the body, I can't disconnect those. So where that inflammation goes depends on where the weakness is in your body. Um, that's why there's so many different things can be affected. Um, by removing the food, and it's not necessarily gluten. Like I said, there's lots of other ones as well. But that is often where people start. <coughs> but when we start to look at what the, the root cause is, um, then we can start to see some of the other areas too, other areas that might be of a concern. So if your weakness, like I said, is um, in your thyroid, you might get Hashimoto's. If you have a digestive system weakness, you might get IBS or Crohn's. Or if your brain is a weakness, then you might get things like dementia. Once you have one autoimmune condition, unfortunately, it opens up the door for you to have another one. Very significantly opens up the door. So you might start by just having a mild arthritis or something like that that's quite manageable. It's not really destroying your life. But what about if the next one you got was MS or Lyme disease, which are very devastating. And there's many other more serious ones as well. So we need to start looking at it before, like I said, the damage gets done where we can't reverse the, the, uh, the damage that has already been happening. So there's some simple ways to, to look at the situation. And what is really commonly um, found in the natural palate or functional medicine society is they'll have you do a 21-day food elimination diet. And so you'll take out a number of foods. Um, if you can handle it, you'll take out all the 7 or 11 um, most common foods. And you take them out for 21 to 28 days. And in 21 days, if you've really been true and honest with yourself, because it's only yourself that's going to um, get affected if you're not, if you're being only true and honest, within 21 to 28 days, your bodies will have dealt with the inflammation and, um, and got itself kind of almost like a, a place of reset where it can now um, start over in some ways. And then you start bringing stuff back and you see what the reaction actually is to each of those foods so you know whether or not which food is really the problem. Because we don't want to take out a bunch of foods that we don't really need to take out. If they're, you know, like I said, these are not unhealthy foods. They're not bad for us. Well, sugar is. <laughs> I hate to tell you that. But processed sugar um, is not our friend. And one of the reasons why that is is because of this balance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. Sugar and stress and things like that allow the bad bacteria, or the unfriendly ones, to overcome and overpopulate the good ones. So, how do we protect the good ones? Well, Dr. Tom O'Brien um, refers to it as 
stop putting fuel on the fire, right? So stop putting those things in your body or on your body or around your body that are actually causing the problem. So we go back to the, the three sections, right? Food, toxins, and infections. So infections are things like uh, candida and SIBO. It could be um, fungal infections. It could be parasite infections. Um, a lot of those things can be really difficult to narrow down. Um, they're hard to diagnose. And so, in uh, my opinion, if you suspect that kind of thing, you're probably going to need some help from a functional medicine doctor because they can be really stubborn to treat and they can be really hard to find. In their medical field, they'll say, oh, it's not a problem. Um, it, uh, because it, in their, their scale, what they consider normal um, is here, but in the naturopathic world, we know that, that the normal still is not proper. It's not right. And when we have a, a blood test or something like that done, they say it's average. Your average is okay. Like, so thyroid, for example, you have a thyroid test done, you ranked average. You ranked average among everybody else that had this test done. So why did everybody else have this test done? Because they suspect that they have a thyroid problem. It's not average to everybody in the world. It's average to everybody that's had the test done. Right? So it's important to understand that. Because that might, that's why the functional medicine world will look at those numbers in a different way than what the medical community will. So how do we not destroy our microbiome? Our microbiome is what we call all these good bacteria and the bad bacteria, all these little microorganisms that are living inside of our body. And this has become a really um, hot topic now. All the advertisers are jumping in on protect your microbiome, protect your microbiome, um, because uh, they want to jump in on the, some of the science that's happening. And that's great. They're trying to sell their product. They can go ahead and sell their product, but that doesn't mean that we have to buy it. So one of the things that's the worst um, to affect our microbiome is actually um, the overuse of antibiotics and antibacterials. Now, are antibiotics bad? Of course not. Antibiotics have a really important role, and they've played a huge part of our society and, and kept us at, uh, safe from many different things. But although we've gotten better in the last few years, doctors used to allow us, if we went in and had a, a viral infection, you know, they'd, we'd get an antibacterial. Well, that's not going to help, right? We know that. And, and so our society really has played a big part. We want that fast answer to everything nowadays. And so we've created this perfect storm um, for conditions like food reactions to really take a, and, and make a, a keyhole and, and really dig into our society and affect us in so many ways. Antibacterial soaps, I've heard so many different um, functional medicine doctors talk that antibacterials, in their opinion, has been one of the single worst thing that our society has ever done. We don't need antibacterial soaps to kill the bacteria and the, and the germs. We just need to wash our gosh darn hands with soap and water. <laughs> Turn the darn tap on and wash your hands. And it's great that we're trying to save water nowadays, but at what cost to that, right? Instead, we're going to use all these chemicals that we don't have to use water on, but what is the cost of using those chemicals? How is that actually affecting our, our body? Advertisers have really trained us to believe that their products are what's going to solve all of our issues. And for generations, we've heard this. And so, so many times, um, we have really... What we think is science is actually advertising. And so we have to really watch and be careful with what we're allowing ourselves to believe. Another thing that affects our microbiome is overuse of medications. Most medications have some kind of effect on the microbiome in our, our digestive system or in our entire body. And again, medications aren't necessarily bad, but do we need them? Can we? Can we solve some of those problems without necessarily always going to a medication? Um, the quick answer is not always the best long-term answer. The next one is top the toxic exposure. Ditch anything with fragrance in it, especially things like room spray and um, dryer sheets and scented anything. 
these things not only affect our digestive system and our microbiome, but they also affect our endocrine system. And our endocrine system is affected by our hormones, it our allows our hormones to, to move through our body. And these things help to stop that production or stop the efficient um, transfer of, of our hormones. So you think of it as a lock and key system. And so we might produce progesterone and there's a hormone and then there's a key and it needs to find the lock and key in order for our body to, to use that. Well, if we are, um, these chemicals, what they do is they kind of make it so that the, the lock and key can't fit together anymore. It kind of, it's kind of like putting a very big old um, glove on top of a, uh, on top of it so that it can't recognize that that's the right spot and it bounces off that and it goes looking for another one. In the meantime, the body says, hey, I don't have enough of that hormone. I gotta make some more and it makes some more and it makes some more and next thing you know, you have way more of these hormones bouncing around in your body than you really um, aren't absorbing things. So they make more and they make more. Eating processed sugar and sugar alternatives. Um, sugar is what the bad bacteria or the non-friendly people um, thrive off of. They thrive off of stress and sugar. And so if we're constantly feeding them sugar, they're going to be happy and healthy. Um, but when they get out of control and they're happy and healthy, there's only so much balance. And that means your, your, your good bacteria have to work that much harder um, to get things done and to, and to be happy and healthy itself. So one of the first things that you can do is to start cutting back on the amount of sugar we have. And eliminating sugar is difficult because sugar is more addicting than codeine or, or cocaine, I mean, or alcohol or tobacco or anything. And yet, as a society, we just turn the blind eye and keep allowing the processed co food companies to hide sugar in everything. They put sugar in everything. They have chemists that that's their job is to figure out how much sugar they can hide in our tomato sauce and in absolutely everything we eat. So taking a look at what the sugar content is that you and your family are, are eating will help drastically affect um, your gut bacteria. We talked about um, infections a little bit. I saw it's funny when I first started um, learning all of it, a lot of this. Um, I joked with Roberta years ago that if I ever start a blog, I should call it Astrid's Way, which is my grandma, um, because you keep turning around and it's like, oh, grandma said <laughs> I should eat less bread. Grandma said you should have some sauerkraut. It's good for you. Grandma said you should eat some bone broth when you're not feeling good, right? Grandma said you should chew your food. <laughs> the digestive uh, process starts actually even before we even take a bite. Um, saliva starts to accumulate in our mouth um, when we smell food. And so we need to um, let the process do its job properly. So chewing your food is huge. Give your gut half a chance and, uh, and chew the food before you get there. And again, today's society, we are in such a hurry all the time. We're always on the run. We don't sit down and appreciate our food like we used to. When we grew up, when we were kids, we ate together as a family, right? Well, we did that for lots of different reasons. But one of the things that we didn't realize we were doing when we were doing that is that we were showing more gratitude. We were slowing down and we were showing gratitude for our food. And that's, there's a whole lot of brain stuff going on there and how that all affects our gut-brain connection. Um, but just being, just slowing down and appreciating what you're eating and who prepared it for you is huge. Um, back when, um, when my grandma was around and we'd go, we'd always say grace. And whether you're religious or not, it was a way of, of showing gratitude for what you were eating and who prepared it for you. We're eating on the on the run nowadays, we just lose, we lose track of that family connection, but we're also doing some physical damage. So what are some of the things that we can do to help build up our good bacteria? Carla talked about it a little bit already, about um, Ninja Red. Ninja Red is amazing for gut health. It helps to um, heal the gut lining. Uh, it helps to give us energy. 
Another, and L-glutamine is another really good uh, supplement to take. It's just a powder you can add to a smoothie or whatever, and it helps with the, um, the gut lining and, and to repair that gut connection. But one of the cheapest and best things that we can add to our diet is what Grandma said, which is chicken soup. <laughs> Um, bone broth is huge. Bone broth helps to um, repair that leaky gut, to close that junction off, to um, uh, let the mucosal lining help rebuild itself. Um, collagen has a big part of that and why that works. And bone broth is inexpensive. It doesn't cost us barely anything to make because we already bought the chicken. We paid for the bones, right? Throw the bones inside a slow cooker, add a little bit of um, apple cider vinegar, um, maybe some celery and some onion and a little bit of peppercorn or something like that and leave it go. I leave my chicken broth go for 24 hours and I just take it out and strain it. And it tastes delicious. And instead of having a, well, I don't drink coffee, but instead of having a tea, uh, when I was healing, I would take two, three glasses of bone broth every day. And that is what I do when, if I ever get glutened, um, accidentally have some cross-contamination somehow or or I don't know what it is and I have that same kind of reaction, then first thing I do is make sure I have some bone broth. So I either keep some in the fridge or either in the freezer so I can take it out if I ever do that. And th that's the first thing is close that junction back up and let that, that gut help to start repair that itself. Um, eat it fermented foods, like I said, grandma told us to eat sauerkraut, <laughs> of course. It was kind of gross. <laughs> but there, sauerkraut doesn't have to be really sour. There's all kinds of different ways you can make sauerkraut. And so you do you. Um, but give it a try. It's so easy. You can chop up some um, cabbage, throw a little salt on there, massage it in, leave it on the counter for half an hour to an hour until you start seeing some liquid being pulled out of it. And then throw it in a jar and pack it solid in a jar. Stick it on the, the shelf um, with a piece of... Um, broadcloth on top and a good elastic band, leave it for a couple days, taste it, and then put it in the fridge. It's, you don't need to buy a starter. You don't need to buy anything. There's recipes all over the internet, of course, but it doesn't have to be that difficult. Now, if you leave it for a long period of time, you're gonna have that really sour stuff that I used to hate as a kid, um, but the stuff I make really doesn't taste a whole lot different than cold slaw. So it all depends on how long you leave it to ferment for. Digestive enzymes um, help a huge bit because we don't have the enzymes. As we get older, we start to lose our ability to digest food. We lose the digestive enzymes that are within our gut. And so by replacing some of those digestive enzymes, um, we can help our body to be more efficient. Young Living makes a great digestive enzyme. I didn't have a lot of success with other um, digestive enzymes before, um, but when I started using the Young Living ones, I actually found that they really worked. And I thought, so as Carl already explained about how the essential oils are inside the supplements, and uh, so I don't know if that's why that whole ability to open the gate, like she said, allowing things to get into our body more efficiently. Um, but I've had a huge success with the Young Living digestive enzymes. And of course, increasing our fiber and our water intake. We know that fiber is important, but fiber is also not just for important for our bowel movements and to keep our body regular, but it's also important part of, it's an absolute necessary part of detoxifying. Toxins in our body when they're released from their cells need fiber to remove them out of our body. They attach to, those, to the fiber and then they move through our stool and we get rid of them. But if we don't have enough fiber and we release those toxins, then the toxins start to actually reabsorb back into our body. We don't want that. We want them out. Goodbye, senior. <laughs> um, take a hike, right? So increasing um, your fiber is really important. Of course, if you suddenly increase your fiber, you might not have the result you want. So you need to be a little bit careful about what kind of fiber you eat and making sure that you're increasing your water with it. Water is the staff of life, we all know that, um, but we don't necessarily drink enough. I mean, how much, I've seen that, I mean, the water has been really empty and out there at the back, right? But, you know, I'm supposed to drink at least three or four of these today. Have I yet? Not quite. I'm, not, I'm only at two or so, right? So if we're not being really careful about how much water we're drinking, we might not realize we, that we really aren't getting enough. 
I always at home, I try to measure it out in the morning because then I can see at the end of the day if I still have bottles that are sitting on the counter that I haven't drank yet. And I guess I haven't been doing my job. Vitamin D, Carla mentioned that already. Vitamin D is incredibly important um, for our gut and helping the repair and the uh, connections to repair themselves and to heal. And just the little bit that we get from the sun is not going to be enough. Not if you have digestive problems. Getting more sleep, of course, is really important. If we don't get enough sleep, then our body can't recover. And this is probably my big Achilles heel. I'm terrible about sleep. Ron does really good. He goes to bed hours before I do. Um, and I know this is something that I have to keep working on. But if we don't give our body half a chance to recover and repair itself, then how can we expect, even if we eat the best foods and the best supplements in the world, if we're not giving it enough sleep, then how is it going to ever have time to recover? Take time for self-care and help your body deal with the stress. We've talked a lot about that today. Um, self-care is hugely important, and we've talked a lot about how stress and how different ways to deal with that. So I hope you go home today with a few new things that you can try. And the last one is to move your body. I remember doctors telling me all the time, mobility creates, movement creates mobility. And I told, yeah, well, I don't, when you feel like shit... You don't want to exercise. That's true. But until you start making a change, how do you expect there to be a change? You have to make the first step. You have to start change. And then um, let the body help to recover all that. But uh, it's like um, the old theory of um, uh, object in motion stays in motion, right? And we all learned that in junior high. Well, it's the same thing as, our, you know, we have to start. We have to push that cart first and get it going, um, how, whatever that way that means for you. But starting to exercise doesn't necessarily mean you have to you know, go out and do a squat thing for 10 minutes, right? Go for a walk. Go do some yoga. Whatever. Whatever works for you. Um, but you just have to start somewhere. Find something that you enjoy and keep looking for more. There's so many neat things that you can do nowadays with um, things online. There's all kinds of different programs, meditation programs. Um, Curly is here. She does amazing meditation in our community. You know, there's people that aren't far away from wherever you live that do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, in my um, school, I, while I'm at school, I'm creating a program to help people go through uh, and figure out ways to, to reset their digestive health and to find out what foods are not serving their body well. Again, not that the foods aren't bad, but what are they really serving you? And in that program, I gave people a challenge that I want to give you guys today. It's great to come here and uh, hear all these great new ideas, but if you don't go home and try anything and actually start something, then you're not gonna, there's not going to be any change. So go home today and take a look Take a journal out and, and write down some of the things that you learned today that, you, that really resonated with you. And then how can you connect with something like that? How could you add that into your life? Uh, maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's tapping. Maybe it's whatever, right? Take a look at those things and take a look and see who offers that within my community. Is there somebody that offers that? Yeah, okay, I can't drive to you know, work with this person or that person. Um, but maybe there's something that does something similar to that in my community. Or maybe I can do it online with them. But make a plan and find out at least one thing that you can try. Uh, one thing um, that, that made a difference for you, that resonated with you. And then make a plan to actually add it to your calendar. It's all great to think about it. But we don't add it to our calendar. Then it's not going to change anything, right? So I hope you have enjoyed today.